Could you elaborate a little bit about these five insurmountable barriers to the origins of life theory? First of all, there are 5,000 insurmountable barriers. I chose, they, they could have been much more. I just chose five because I had to somehow limit it. And I think we only got, we didn't even complete all five. Four. Could you explain to us what is the dominant scientific perspective on the origins of life and why are you critical of it? All right. First of all, I'm critical because it's nonsense. The current paradigm is that there was, there was some pond and there were lightning strikes and it caused simple molecules to come together to form the molecules of life. Those molecules of life then came together and you got the first cell. And that cell then became the origin for all of the, the life that we see today. Multicellular organisms, which then slithered out of the pond, and that's what you have. Sometimes people talk about uh, coming from other interstellar space, that the first cells came from there. That's not the question. It's really the question of what's the origin of first life? Where did that cell come from? How did that cell come about? If some uh, aliens planted it here, I'm okay with that. Where did the aliens come from? We're talking about the origin of first life. But all of these models that they have, this uh, primordial soup model, they're all a bunch of nonsense. That's why I'm skeptical, because none of them work. None of them work. And, and one of the ways you could test this is you could, you could try to bring me on again onto your channel with an origin of life researcher. But I'll require you that they have a PhD so they understand me. Because when I, when I went through that debate, and that was the first debate of my life. I've never had a debate before. But this was with a YouTuber. He calls himself the, the title professor, but he's just a YouTuber. And he didn't understand what I was talking about. He could not fathom the chemistry. That's why I say if you can get a PhD, they have to have a PhD in organic chemistry, synthetic organic chemistry, or a PhD in biochemistry. I will come on the channel and they can present their scenarios and I'll discuss with them. But I know I'll never be back in that way because you'll never get any of them coming on. They refuse to talk with me, which should tell you immediately that there's a problem here. And with every passing year, the problem becomes bigger because we get further away from that target. And so, so uh, that's the primordial soup model. None of them work because small molecules don't just come together based on lightning strikes. And then they have to start hooking together. And then you have to get them in pure form. So none of the steps work. None of them have been demonstrated. The Miller-Urey experiment, which took some small molecules and got some amino acids, fails to explain that there were many, many amino acids that formed many carboxylic acids, many amines. And then the mixture itself would have been totally unusable. That's why after 70 years since that experiment, nothing's come of it. Nothing. Basic models, just the science itself screams out, these don't work. And that's why I'm so skeptical. But I remember watching this debate where you were presenting uh, five barriers. And I remember I was watching the video and I was trying to take a screenshot on, on those five insurmountable barriers that you presented to the origins of life. However, I did find them somewhere else. And you, you can elaborate a little bit more, but I remember you talked about polytide formation. You talked about polynucleotide assembly. You talked about polysaccharide synthesis. You talked about specified information in polymers. And then you talked about assembly into integrated living systems, or in other words, cell formation. And you said these are five barriers. And I remember you kept writing on the board, we're clueless about this. You're clueless about this. You're clueless about this. And I just remember systematically you were showing in a very scientific and logical way, look, these are barriers that you cannot surmount, you know, in regards to the origin of life, and you don't have answers. And that's why he kept reverting to the denigration. Could you elaborate a little bit about these five insurmountable barriers to the origins of life theory? First of all, there are 5,000 insurmountable barriers. I chose, they, they could have been much more. I just chose five because I had to somehow limit it. And I think we only got we didn't even complete all five. But um, I gave him all the small molecules. Making the small molecules with an anti-purity, meaning handedness, is a very difficult problem. In fact, the one class of molecules, the sugars, that, that he said the foremost reaction makes, I said that would be useless. You can't use the foremost reaction. He says, what do you mean? The foremost reaction makes these. Well, just a paper just came out this year by a, a top origin of life researcher, Ramanand Krishnamurthy saying that exactly what I said, that the foremost reaction would be unusable because it makes too many compounds. It doesn't make what you want. You don't have the small molecules, but I gave them that. But let's say you had the small molecules. How do you hook them together? We don't know how to hook together the amino acids to make the polypeptides. These are all the things that make up the enzymes that make up uh, our proteins. We don't know how to hook these together. And the reason for that is, is because when you're hooking molecules together, you have to hook one end, it has one end and another end. You have to 
you have to hook this up like this. And what happens is they have other pendants hanging off that can get in the way. They can end up hooking up and they're not supposed to hook up. Nobody has ever solved that problem. Nobody. So we don't know how to make the polymers of the amino acids. If you take the sugars, you don't know how to, which are called saccharides or carbohydrates. We don't know how to hook those up. Those are very difficult because they have many different pendants hanging off that would conflict. So we can't make the polymers of those. Then the, the other things are the, the nucleotides, which make up the DNA and the RNA. We don't know how to hook those up. There's no chemistry to hook those up on a prebiotic earth. You need enzymes to make all of these things. The enzymes haven't been made yet. This is a prebiotic earth. So we can't make any of the three classes of polymers that have to be made. We have no idea of how to make those. So those are three of the five questions. Then the next question was the specified information. You need an informational code. Of these polymers that we can't make, if you had the polymer, you have to have some code to say how are they going to arrange how are they going to give you the code for building? So your DNA, the way DNA works is it is the arrangement of the four different letters, the four different nucleotides. And that arrangement spells out how the proteins, the little enzymes that build our bodies are going to be arranged. And then those proteins go and carry out the tasks. Nobody knows where the origin of information is. I'm not just the only one to say this. Everybody's saying this. Everybody thinks, yeah, we have no idea of the origin of information. And then the last thing is, if I gave you all the polymeric materials, all the small molecules you wanted, in fact, if I just took a cell and deconstructed it, which we can do, you can deconstruct a cell. So you have all the molecules that were there in the cell. Now just put it back together again. In that I'm, I'm giving you all the polymers, you already have the specified information. The information is there. Can you, if you had all these components, could you put them together to form a working cell? And nobody, nobody who has, who has a PhD, who knows this stuff, would ever say that they can put them together to start working and forming a living system. So those are five questions. None of them can be solved. But I'm telling you, there are 5,000 questions. Those are just 5,000 that need to be solved. We have no solution to. And so that's why we have no idea where life came from. That's how clueless we are. Dr. Tor, I know you touched on this a little bit. Someone might, you know, push back and say, now we have much more advanced models for how life might have originated. Why do you think these still fall short? What are some of the issues there with some of these more advanced models? You mean more advanced models than we had two years ago when I proposed these five barriers? <laughs> so uh, no, we haven't had more advanced models in the last two years. Uh, no, they still hold. None of them are solvable. In your model, you're going to have to make these molecules. In order to make life, we're made out of molecules. And uh, we're not made out of uh, silicon chips. So we're made out of molecules. So you're going to have to solve that. Any cell is made out of molecules. So you got to start with the components to make a cell. We don't know how to solve those. So no, nobody knows how to do that. We don't know where the code came from. And even if you had all the molecules, we don't know how to assemble them together. We don't know how to do this. It's unknown because there's so many non-covalent. That means not hooking molecules together, just the way molecules align with each other. So many non-covalent interactions that need to be precise. In fact, these have been estimated. So a single... Yeast cell, which is a, a very simple cell compared to a, a cell that might make up a human, but a simple yeast cell, there are 10 to the 79 billion combinations of just protein-protein interactions. So that's called the interactome. 10 to the 79 billion is a one with 79 billion zeros after it. It's a very, very big number. It's just give you an idea. All the atoms in the universe is 10, 10 to the 90, so a one 90 zeros after it. That's all the atoms in the universe. We're talking 10 to the 79 billion, a one with 79 billion zeros after it. So, so the, these numbers are just crazy large, how these things can order. And uh, you have to get precision on this. So nobody knows where this came from. And so the way a cell works is that when it's dividing, it takes that information and it moves some of the information to one side, some of the information to the other side. So it's duplicating it. And then it necks down. So each new cell has that, that sort of interactome alignment. But where the first one came from, we have no idea. So all of these still hold. In fact, they hold even more so because we're learning each year. We learn more about the cell and the complexity of what's going on here. And so the target becomes further away. So even if people think they're moving closer, the target that we're going toward is moving further away much, much faster. So that's the problem. That's the inherent problem. And even like I said, just to in April of this year, Krishnamurti comes out and says, yeah, the, this foremost reaction that you were banking on, which was the only what's called autocatalytic reaction, which would get going and continue going and continue to propagate, that was relevant to origin of life. The only one 
that was relevant to origin of life, Krishnamurthy is saying, doesn't look autocatalytic to me. Can't get your saccharides this way. So even the one reaction that they had to say that might be an autocatalytic reaction that, that's relevant to origin of life. Now, as of April this year, it's just what I've been saying all along. It's a bunch of nonsense. It was a red herring. It doesn't work. Yeah, it sounds like from what you're saying that time has not worked in favor of the origin of life theory. And that time is showing that these problems are far more concrete, that they're not just going to be easily solved. 